Today, I'm uh, very privileged uh, to host our speaker, Alexander Kachlinski, uh, who is a senior astrophysicist here at NASA Goddard Space Flight. He's also associated with uh, SSAI. I, I wanted to remind you events from Sputnik 1. Sputnik 1 was the first artificial satellite uh, launched on the 4th of October, 1957. It was a very simple metal sphere, 58 centimeters in diameter, with only four external antenna uh, for broadcasting uh, radio waves, uh, radio pulses, and nothing else. It lasted 21 days in space after traveling more than 71 million kilometers. Its success uh, triggered the space race as we know it, as part of the larger Cold War and ushered in new political, military, technological, and scientific developments. In the wake of these successes came young dreamers. Alexander Kachlinski was one of them. Today, he's going to trace his journey back to those days of Sputnik and to the place of his birth, the current day Latvia, which was part of USSR. Sasha had a dream to go to space. That's all he wanted when he was a kid. But fate ruled otherwise. How did this change in direction come about? He's going to walk us through different stages of his life. And I have to remind you that Sasha has had a very illustrious career since he came to Goddard in 1991 and has made important contributions uh, to cosmic infrared and cosmic microwave background radiation. He has also worked on galaxy formation, large-scale structure of the universe, and the dark matter among many other topics. He recently published, he recently published results of a new study where he suggested that what LIGO, we all know what LIGO is, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, might have detected was a merger of primordial black holes. His PhD advisor was no other than Lord Martin Lees, one of the world's most eminent astronomers. He works very closely with John Martha our own Nobel Prize in Physics laureate. Please, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our speaker, Alexander Kachlinski. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. So I'll uh, take you through my personal perceptions of my journey. <clears throat> I don't pretend to be objective. I will just uh, describe how I saw various events uh, in my life. How I ended up here, it was by pure coincidence, as you will hear. I probably would not have ended here if it wasn't for something when I was somewhere around 10 years old. This is, I'm the one in the center here, and these are two other Kashlinskis that keep me on my toes. That in, that's in Shenandoah last summer. My full name is Alexander. Uh, in Russian, it's abbreviated as Sasha. Don't ask me for phonetical connection. But I got my name uh, per Jewish tradition from my grandfather, who died in 1952, Alexander Buxtin. He was a great hero of World War II. He ended it, it as a general. He played most direct role in the various critical battles of that war. Surprisingly, he survived unscathed through the most major battles of that war. He was always at the front. But uh, at the age of 52, um, he had a massive stroke, and he died on the spot. When I was born, uh, five years later, I got his name. There was never a choice of what name I would bear. And my childhood was filled with bedtime stories from my grandmother about Dedushka Sasha, as he was known to me. I never met him. But uh, uh, endlessly, I would hear about his courage, principles, integrity, and I enjoyed these moments very much. Um, when I was born, I'll talk about my very early precognitive years. When I was born, a few weeks later, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik as Charles was saying, on October 4th, 1957. This was followed by the first non-returned animal in space, the dog called Laika, also by the Soviets, it's all Soviets. 
This was followed by the first satellite to leave Earth. It missed the moon, but then it was followed um, a bit later by the first satellite to reach the moon. Then there was safe return of two dogs, first return from space. This was followed by the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. Then there was German Titov, the second man um, to orbit the Earth. There was the first woman in space, Tereshkova, 1963. That's where my memories actively switch on. I remember distinctly her flight, how it was shown on TV. Then there was the first space uh, walk um, by Leonov, Russian cosmonaut. Uh, I also remember it very well. There was the first landing on the moon. The first spacecraft to reach another planet in 1966, it was Venera. Soviets concentrated on Venera, whereas Americans would later concentrate on Mars. And then there was the first spacecraft to enter into orbit around the moon. So all this made the atmosphere where I was growing up uh, to just revolve around space. The space era has dawned. It was a very hot subject in the Soviet Union. Everyone talked about it. And at that time, the US space program was not on the Soviet map. I don't remember anything said about it uh, until uh, a bit later. Not, because, not even because it was political, but simply because Soviets just, they were first in all of these things. All this, of course, changed with the Apollo program. And I remember distinctly, uh, we then lived in a two-room apartment, which was pretty plush on the Soviet scale. It's one bedroom apartment. I remember waking up one weekend. It must have been weekend. And we recently bought a radio set, which was a rarity in those days. It was called Rigonda. And my parents were asleep. I turned it on, and there was a news broadcast uh, from Moscow. And at the end of the broadcast, broadcast, they announced that US has launched a spacecraft, Apollo 8, to go around the moon. That really got me. I was shocked. I was astounded. I remember to this day the color of the walls, uh, the light, the, um, you know, the color of the buttons on that radio set. Uh, now, thanks to Google, I could trace it indeed. It was. U.S. launched it on Saturday, December 21, so it must have been indeed a weekend, uh, Sunday, December 22 in the Soviet Union, and I was completely astounded by this news. It really got me. Um, my recollection is that there were only a few lines in the back of some, perhaps, major newspapers when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, landed on the moon in 1969. And the Soviets then uh, sent their own uh, first rover called Luna Hot in 1970. And it was very much covered by the news. It was, uh, you know, the official talk, as I remember it, was that uh, we never planned for cosmonauts to go to the moon. Why bother? Because if you go today to the uh, Space Museum in uh, Smithsonian Space Museum, you see what happened there. Uh, Soviets were building their own rocket. From what I understand, uh, Saturn, it had five engines, four on the center, really massive engines, uh, where, which were very difficult to build. Soviets went another way, according to what I saw at uh, uh, the Space Museum. There was N1 rocket uh, that was supposed to take cosmo cosmonauts to the moon, and it had 20 smaller engines on the side. And of course, when you have four powerful engines, it goes up. When you have 20 smaller engines, things have to be balanced very finely, because if one engine just emits a bit more than the other engine or ejects a bit more, the rocket goes sideways. That's what I understand happened. But at any rate, they uh, launched, I remember this first uh, rover, Luna Hot, was very much in the news uh, as opposed to Apollo 11. But 
Interestingly, and I remember it very distinctly, when Apollo 13 happened, uh, in my recollection, the human aspect won, and I recall ongoing coverage of that, uh, quite uh, you know, detailed. I remember people talked about it everywhere, on buses, school, radio. I recall a great sigh of relief when it landed back successfully. I remember many details, like when they uh, had to design this filter to clear carbon dioxide in space. I remember when there was, what it seems to me to be in real time, when there was this extra minute of blackout when they were landing and um, it seemed that it was uh, gone, but it landed successfully. So when I saw the Apollo 13, which is an excellent movie, uh, decades later, every detail I remember, or more or less every post-launch detail, I remember the way uh, it was reflected then. Uh, I recall later the Soyuz Apollo docking in space in 1975. It was a big event in the Soviet Union. It didn't click with me at all. Perhaps, uh, as I will talk a bit later, I was already uh, in the dissident underground at that time and uh, it just um, didn't click with me. In late 60s, uh, I came across this book that is probably the single biggest reason why I'm here. I remember I was looking, I was walking around our living room and uh, looking for a book to read on our bookshelves. And by pure chance, I came across this book. Uh, uh, people here probably know Stanislav Lem. He's a Polish science fiction writer. Solaris is uh, probably his most well-known book here. But this book, The Magellanic Cloud, it completely swept me off of my feet. It was about, it was about, about the first um, uh, interstellar travel to Alpha Centauri system. Uh, completely conquered my mind. That's what I wanted to do after I read that, after I read that book. I don't remember exactly whether it was before Apollo 8 or after Apollo 8, but around that time that I read it, it completely swept me off my feet. It was the single most defining uh, moment for me uh, professionally, but I never got to go to stars, and this is why the title of uh, my talk is what it is. Uh, some decades later, I got a hold of that book again, many decades later. Uh, after I moved to Israel, uh, I didn't have access to science fiction in writing, in, in Russian, and then I uh, um, just many years later when uh, I could access it again, it just, I couldn't get past the first few pages. But at that time, it uh, really got me. Interestingly that, as I'm sure you know, uh, there is an Earth-type planet in the habitable zone in the Proxima system, just as described in that book. So in a way it was prophetic, but this is the single book that probably was uh, uh, instrumental in my doing what I'm doing. Um, in the Soviet Union, you had pretty much the same system of school as here. You had elementary school, you had middle school, you had secondary school, what is high school. And uh, secondary school at that time was 10 years. So once I finished my um, middle school, I wanted to go to a Missy Medical School in Riga. Um, this is an equivalent of what is known here as magnet schools. And uh, the most uh, famous and hard to get into school in Riga was, of course, school number one. What else? Um, and it was Missy Medical School in Riga. Uh, interestingly, it was founded in 1211. So uh, if you go to Wikipedia and uh, go to the list of the oldest schools in the world, you will come across that school near the top. Um, so I uh, really wanted to get in there. into there. There were uh, entrance exams. I uh, prepared for them. I took them. The examiner there was someone called Alexandra Linishna Matveva. 
Um, she was to be my uh, Missy Maddox teacher in that school, uh, my favorite teacher. She passed away as soon as we graduated. She was dying of lung cancer as we were graduating. Uh, but she was a fantastic teacher, and uh, uh, we clicked instantly. Those who know Russian system of names, there is first name and there is patronymic. So Alexandra Ilinishna is Alexandra, daughter of Ilya. And I was Alexander Ilyich. I'm Alexander, son of Ilya. So it's a rare uh, uh, combination. So these were the toughest exams I ever took in life since then. I remember them distinctly. I passed them and got in, and I'm very happy I did. Uh, so I spent the two years from 1971 to 1973 until graduation there, and alongside Cambridge, uh, later, this was the best student time of my life. I remember it when uh, years later I saw that movie, if people know uh, Dead Poets Society, it was as if it was taken out of uh, this uh, school. So uh, I would also start my dissident activities about which I will talk uh, uh, in a moment there, and uh, this defined the rest. And, uh, this came at the expense of my studies, as I, uh, I realize now. Interestingly, when preparing this talk, I came across September issue of the Physics Today about the Physics Olympiad. And there was this line that US Physics Olympiad team competitors spent a week training in Latvia before the Olympiad. I bet it was in that school. So I have sweetest memories of that school. Um, my last years in USR, as I was growing up, as I was um, um, maturing, uh, the iniquity and the wickedness of the Soviet totalitarian system became ever so clear. I can spend you know, many talks on that, but I wouldn't. So I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, every thought of every citizen had to be controlled from birth, not only how you should think, but also how you should not uh, not only how you should not think, but it was what made it totalitarian, also how you should think. Um, as I was growing up, that regime's terrible crimes of millions killed, murdered, and tens of millions imprisoned over the past four decades before I was born from 1917 were already whispered about, appeared even in some official books. So I joined... Um, dissident circles at that time. And uh, I traveled um, quite a bit clandestinely to my peers in dissident uh, movement to Leningrad and Moscow. I was in charge of that. What we did is really innocent on American scale. We would distribute the legal literature, um, talk to others and to us and so on. And the legal literature sometimes would even uh, be defined as some of the very rich um, Russian classics. For instance, Dostoevsky's Bessie, or Devils, I think in English, was banned in the Soviet Union. So this literature would be self-typed most of the time. Uh, and that means that someone on a typewriter would type the entire book, and then it would go into circulation. Just to understand how dangerous the stuff that was is that in the Soviet Union, typewriters you could not buy. My parents, they were that they taught uh, in, um, at an institute, so they got a special permission to buy a typewriter, I remember. We had a typewriter at home. The funds from that typewriter had to be given to the KGB, and KGB would have an archive of these funds. So I didn't type anything on that typewriter because of that. But uh, you know, many of these books would be self-typed. You get a book, you spend the night reading it, you pass it on, then it gets passed on again, and so on. It was dangerous stuff. And occasionally, we get, would get some books from uh, foreign tourists who would come, especially with that collection of books, to the Soviet Union. And at one of these clandestine meetings, I very briefly even met Andrei Sakharov 
that was in Moscow sometime, maybe 75. He was a, and I think even the leader, the leader of the Soviet dissident movement, a man of great courage. Uh, there is really no one like him anymore. Uh, the Czech Václav Havel may come close to his uh, um, uh, qualities. But he was also a fantastic scientist. Late awakening cosmology, I discovered his major contributions to this field done in 1960s. And they were things like Sakharov oscillations, what is today known as Doppler peaks in the cosmic microwave background. And he was the first to propose how baryon asymmetry can be generated in the universe because of CP violation, also in the 60s and so on. He was an unbendable uh, man of great principles, integrity, and uh, 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 bravery. So, um, I plan to move to Israel once I reach 18, uh, the earliest stage one could apply. Uh, and when I reached 18, I finished a third year of physics at Latvian State University in Riga. There are five years uh, that you study in the Soviet Union, or in those days it was five years. So um, I started applying, the process was known, you would be kicked out of university, you may be allowed to leave, you may not be allowed to leave, uh, it was a lottery, and uh, if you're not allowed to leave, there are consequences because you're not in university anymore. But less than one month, I applied on July 4th, 1976. I distinctly remember the day. And less than one month later, apparently they had, were fed up with me because uh, I had some yeah, running scene with the KGB. So less than one month later, I was summoned to that office. It's called Avir in the Soviet Union. Uh, they dealt with these uh, things and informed that I'm stri stripped of my Soviet citizenship and have to leave the Soviet Union in less than eight weeks. So there I was on my way to Israel. Of course, my parents had to stay behind. And it was a literal iron curtain in those days. We were to travel in a fully sealed train car for Vienna, Austria. Fully sealed. No one could enter, no one could leave. Uh, you leave what was literally the Iron Curtain. You never, at those days, it, in those days it seemed never to see uh, those you leave behind again. But, um, so I arrived, I, 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 arrived in Vienna sometime in September 1957. We were put there by Israeli representatives for a short time in a transit camp that was specially prepared for this. And I arrived in Israel on October 1, 1976. I arrived a couple of weeks before the new school year. And I sought a new Hebrew. I learned to study it clandestinely in the Soviet Union. So I signed up to continue with physics at Tel Aviv University. They accepted me into a third year. I finished three years in Riga. Uh, but when lectures began, I discovered what a huge mistake I made because I did not understand a thing in Hebrew. And all books were in English, and I didn't know English. So that really hurt, but there was no way out because at that time, my tuition was already paid as it, for the next three years, as I will talk later, and it was not a money back guarantee. So if I were to quit, uh, I would have to find funds for later. So I had to learn languages together with physics. Uh, and physics-wise, I found Tel Aviv University in those years at an exceptionally high level, where frontier physics especially high energy physics was the goal. In those days, Saskind and Tom Banks were at Tel Aviv University, so that was a very active uh, way. I learned in those years more physics than I could have imagined. The style was very different from what I came across before in Riga, in the Soviet Union, much less formalistic, more physics, less mathematics. In Riga, the stress was on very formal mathematics. You would endlessly prove all sorts of theorems and so on, and special functions, what they should satisfy. And 
at the end of the day, you may forget about physics. Here, uh, the style was much less formalistic. In Vega, all exams were oral. You would be given a list of, um, I don't know, let's say 100 potential questions that you would study before uh, the exam. And then you would come to the exam, which was always oral. No books were allowed. And you pick up like a lottery. There would be tickets on the table. You would pick up a ticket, go prepare, and go answer the, question, uh, the questions in the ticket orally. Um, at Tel Aviv, all exams were written. You could bring any books you wanted to the exam, and the task was to solve physics problems. It really impressed me. Uh, so, you know, some of them were very tough, but you had to solve that. So I found the physics really high, uh, at a high level. Uh, there at the time, I also mastered Hebrew and English, having no choice. Uh, you know, when you have no choice, you can do wondrous things. So I swam. Um, then, um, by about some time in 1978, uh, towards spring of 1978, I completed my bachelor's and master's uh, course requirements with high marks, and I studied my master's thesis. And the topic that was given to me by my uh, master's advisor was based on a terribly wrong paper by him and his two PhD students. I can dwell on it for a long time. It was, uh, the problem was a hydrodynamics of galaxy motion in viscous intracluster medium. So the idea or the claim was that viscosity, which they said is important, they took viscosity from Spitzer's uh, book on the interstellar medium, uh, that viscosity is high, dissipates a lot of heat as galaxy moves through the cluster and contributes and perhaps even dominates the heating of intracluster uh, matter. And I had to solve this problem numerically. But that was a very wrong setup to begin with, as I understood as I went along. Uh, turns out that the reason for the effect was that viscosity, which is proportional to the mean free pass, was high because mean free pass was high. When you evaluate the mean free pass, you get that it's higher than the scale of the cluster, not to mention galaxy. But you cannot apply hydrodynamic approximation here. It's meaningless. The entire problem was wrong. Uh, but my advisor kept me going to bring results, which was a horrible thing because I had to write this program uh, solving Navier-Stokes equations uh, on a CDC Cyber 6600 computer. Don't know how many of, the, of you here are aware of this. And it was, uh, you know, I would punch these cards. I would run these programs only during the night because uh, during the day computer time was spoken for. So I would work during the day, run it during the night. The problem, the program didn't work. There were artificial shocks and the whole darn situation cannot be applied. I was highly discouraged by what I saw and almost quit science. It really was bad this particular uh, year in terms of science. Uh, but at that time, I was accepted into Cambridge, so I wrote up what I had and uh, got my master's and left. But at the end of the day, it was an extremely wasteful year where I knew less physics at the end than at the beginning. So I arrived in Cambridge, England, um, for my PhD studies in October 1979, and got very fortunate to work under supervision of Martin Rees there. He was an exact opposite of my master's advisor. Uh, true scientific curiosity, openness to new ideas, enthusiasm for research, I can go on and on. And he was very intuitive in physics. I remember in the beginning, I would just write long equations, show him the result, and he wouldn't even look at equations. He would say, well, Sasha, you know, this is all very interesting, but it cannot be because of A, B, C, intuitive reasons. And you would immediately understand that, yes, it cannot be. You have a problem somewhere. I later uh, ho learned uh, 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 his style, uh, not as well as him, but I learned it. 
That was a complete change from my master's uh, uh, thesis. Martin gave me lots of papers to read, then gave more papers to read, then still more papers to read. We talked, we discussed, he suggested at that time to think about formation of first stars in the universe, the so-called population three. You have population one stars such as the sun, which has roughly solar metallicity. Then you go to the bulge of our galaxy, you have poor uh, metallicity, but non-zero metallicity population two stars, but you don't see any stars with zero metallicity, stars that formed first out of Big Bang. What were they? was a big question. So that was population three. I agreed to think about it. I had complete freedom what to engage in at the Institute of Astronomy. Martin was always there, always enthusiastic, always eager to brainstorm and direct me from what uh, uh, was uh, trivial, wrong, and so on. Uh, socially, I was also a member of that Cambridge system. I was a member of Christ College. Um, uh, that's the college that Charles Darwin went to and about which uh, he said that it was uh, the biggest waste of time of his life. But I actually enjoyed that college very much. Uh, the social interdisciplinary aspect of it, uh, uh, my three closest friends there were doing PhDs in biochemistry on Hegel and in computer science. So we covered pretty much uh, the entire uh, spectrum. Um, and we would discuss it over beer, of course. In 1981, I came up with my greatest, what I consider to be my greatest idea so far, not terribly well known, unfortunately, proposing a concrete mechanism for formation of elliptical and spiral galaxies. And I published it. This is my first paper. Very proud of it. Maybe one day it will be uh, paid attention to. I had a few more papers, continued working with uh, Martin Rees on Population 3, and I finished the dissertation with our joint paper on Population 3 Formation and Evolution. Here it is. It was the first paper that actually put Population 3 on the map. Uh, so I had a successful uh, and very relaxing PhD defense in April of 1983. Uh, it was in Paris because uh, Martin chose that Bernard Jones and Joe Silk be my external examiners. They were on sabbatical in Paris at the time, and it was cheaper to send me to Paris for my sabbatical, than, uh, for my defense, than to bring both of them to Cambridge. So I, I got to spend uh, uh, time in Paris uh, for my defense. Uh, very enjoyable. Um, one thing that I came across uh, in my PhD and which stuck to me is the anthropic principle. I remember in my first year at Cambridge, I came across Martin Rees's paper called Our Universe and Others um, on his desk and was truly amazed by what I read there. Uh, physics appears to be a set of second order, mostly linear equations. That's why we have waves. Um, in a three-dimensional world plus time, that's all. At its core, all the structure is fixed by the values of the fundamental constants. G, C, Planck constant, and a few others, a finite set. There appears to be no basis for these particular values. Why C, for instance, has to be 300,000 kilometers per second rather than three miles an hour. Um, or two dimensionality of the world. Yet, these choices, or whatever, coincidences, appear to, only to be the only ones that would produce life in the universe. That's really mysterious to me. It stuck with me for all this time. For example, the three-dimensionality of space is the only dimensionality that can allow life. In two-dimensional world, uh, you would not be able to have metabolism because here is the dog uh, from Hawking's Brief History of Time. Uh, you swallow the bone, you have to release it. Uh, no uh, digestion is perfect. And you would fall apart at the first uh, 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 energy consumption in life. If you go to modern three dimensions, you can satisfy yourself 
that you cannot have any planetary systems whatsoever. And the reason is that central gravity goes like this for n dimensional world. It's essentially uh, how the area of the sphere goes in n dimensional world. But centrifugal forces remain proportional to one over r cube. If you have n greater than three, centrifugal forces will always, always be defeated by gravity. Everything will fall onto the center, onto the star. Everything will be nuclear burned or worse. So only three-dimensional world would allow planetary systems and would allow life. Uh, it stuck uh, with me for all this time. So after my PhD, I went back to do my regular military service uh, in Israel, uh, 83 to 85. I started a private and finished a private, no particular advancements there. But I had a very good commander whose only problem was that he couldn't pronounce name Sasha. It would always come out Shasa, Sasa, uh, what a Shasha, but never Sasha. So after a few weeks, he got fed up. He said, I'm the top dog here or something like this. And he issued a military order in our platoon that I be called Alex, not Sasha. So I became Private Alex. So that's how I served there. And he even allowed me to continue with some research in the army, which I wrote up afterwards. Uh, here is uh, that paper. I wrote an acknowledgment to him. And later, when I visited Los Alamos sometime around 86, Sterling Colgate uh, even introduced me unexpectedly to me for the most original acknowledgment he has seen, or something like this. So at least that part of my paper has been read. Um, I came to America in 1985. It was to Charlottesville, Virginia. I was at the NREO, jointly with the University of Virginia, and it was a very different world to, uh, from what I have encountered before. I was a hardcore theorist. And NREO dealt with observations and dealt with them very well. Galaxy formation ideas also changed uh, while I was in the Army. There was now so-called biased galaxy formation, and uh, the total omega density parameter of the universe being one ruled the sinking. I worked then on stellar dynamics. I also got into uh, large-scale structure and cosmic microwave background. And at that time, I just openly, perhaps to my, uh, undoubtedly to my detriment, was skeptical of this whole setup of biased galaxy formation. Much of this turned out to be right, some of it perhaps not, but uh, uh, it was just not the right context uh, to construct series on because the universe would have had to be way too young and there were numerous other issues. Um, but there I developed my first regard for observational science. And, um, I started slowly drifting from being a hardcore theorist to actually looking around and seeing what the world really looks at. I arrived at Goddard in October 1991 as an NRC with the Kobe project under John Mother, and it was already after Kobe has established from the first several minutes uh, of its virus uh, running that a cosmic microwave background had a remarkably precise black body spectrum. So that meant that Big Bang was hot and dense. There was no way around it. In fact, you would be hard pressed to get such a black body um, in the lab. Um, but I was still a hardcore theorist when I arrived, uh, wired to think free, or what seemed to me as free. And uh, it never seemed to me that the universe can become so measurable and so testable. So John ran Kobe very well, as I were to understand later. And uh, um, there were numerous checks. There were no leaks, total embargo and everything. And I also found John to be extremely open and curious about new science. It's a rare and visionary quality. I think there should be more of it. But my science philosophy was about to change 
in May 1992, I was going to an APS meeting in Washington to hear that Kobe DMR, differential microwave radiometers, discovered cosmic microwave background angular anisotropies. And there on the spot, the world has changed to me together with my philosophy. It was indeed that data, such data, can be obtained and they do motivate theory and not the other way around. I was still skeptical about the cold deck matter. I'll come to that in a minute. Sometime around May 1993, I asked John if I could do something on Kobe. He suggested to think something for Derby. It's the third Kobe experiment, a cosmic infrared background, how to get to the cosmic infrared background. The problem there is that the foregrounds are huge at these wavelengths. This is the signal, roughly speaking, that you anticipate these are the various foregrounds. Foregrounds, signal. In the cosmic microwave background, the situation was the exact opposite. The signal just stands up. Here is another thing that looks puzzling to me along the lines of the anthropic principle. There is no reason why cosmic microwave background has to have temperature of three degrees Kelvin. But if it was hotter, not slightly hotter, but an order of magnitude hotter, it would lie somewhere here. And we would never have discovered that there was a Big Bang. It's a remarkable coincidence that cosmic microwave background is three degrees Kelvin. So oh, I proposed to John that alternatively let's look at fluctuations. The idea is that these are tremendous foregrounds, but they're smooth. So if you cannot measure the mean level, you can measure perhaps fluctuations which you can predict through other means. It's like if you have an infinitely bright screen which is completely homogeneous, you do differential measurement, you maybe will see uh, uh, a signal from behind that screen. So Stan Odenwald joined us at that time and the project started. We worked uh, on Derby data for three years and then for three years more and developed various tools that would become very handy later. But at that time, the most interesting implications eluded us. We published uh, three what I think are ground lane papers with that methodology from that project. In November 1994, I moved to Copenhagen to Nordita and Niels Bohr Institute. That was a very interesting experience. Of course, much of the uh, physics of 20th century has been made there. This is the institute in several buildings. The story has it that Niels Bohr has constructed its structure himself, and you could see why he came um, uh, up with the idea of atom, atomic structure, because topology there was horrendous. I think even after four years, I still have not visited all the alleys. Uh, all these buildings are connected underground. There are floors, half floors, uh, virtual levels. You, you can just uh, uh, get lost there. And uh, most of the science talks were in this room. That probably is familiar to you. That's where the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics has been established. You know, a few faces from here, it's one of these meetings. Einstein, I, I think, is not here. At least I don't see him on others he was. He, of course, never accepted the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And this is the same auditorium in 2016. I was just recently sent it. It was Ben Mottelson's 90th birthday. Um, pleasantly, he looks exactly like the last time I was there, which was 20 years almost ago. So it's, uh, uh, um, um, but it was a very interesting experience with its Nordic nuances, which I tremendously enjoyed. And it was a very rich place, again, in 20th century physics. Um, and at that time, there was Abraham Pais, the great historian of that era, who was known as Bram. He was there in those years in charge of Niels Bohr archives. He was always in Canteen for lunch, so I'm privileged to have uh, two books from him personally inscribed. And uh, um, you could hear all sorts of stories uh, 
uh, from him. I continued CIB collaboration with John Mother and Stone Oldowald on Derby. We also won at that time a seemingly big uh, NASA long-term space astrophysics grant to do our uh, Derby work. And Nordita were very uh, good to me, allowed me a lot of flexibility. I could travel, I could uh, come here. I, they even allowed me an early sabbatical that I spent back here. And uh, uh, I could visit places far and wide. I never had so much trouble or uh, budget as there. I could go to Australia, I could go to South Africa. Uh, you know, sky was the only limit. Um, um, so uh, I was still skeptical about inflation. Um, it's just there was not enough density as I was again getting from a new cluster correlation function data analysis. And at about that time, the three of us have proposed and won uh, to do a CIB fluctuation program with a wire mission that was to map the sky about several tenths of square degrees at 12 and 25. What does CIB stand for? Cosmic infrared background. That's why, yeah. Uh, eh, no, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry. Yeah. That is cosmic microwave background. That's cosmic infrared background. Infrared background is here, emitted by first stars and other stars in the universe. Cosmic microwave background is produced at the Big Bang and is here. Um, so there was one more conference to go to where I was invited to talk about this particular aspect. And that was in California in February 1998. Here I am here. That was my result. I was getting omega from this fit to the cluster correlation function data, the way it depends on cluster richness. Uh, I was getting omega of 0.25 with very small uncertainties. Today, Plan get 0.27. So I flew into California around mid-February, convinced that inflation is wrong, just doesn't work. But at the same conference, two independent groups here have announced their measurement of expansion of the universe from supernovae, what is today known as the dark energy. That was a total uh, revolution. Uh, so I flew in there convinced that inflation is wrong. I flew back convinced that it works. The uh, story was that omega is equal to one total density parameter is equal to one because of the dark energy. No one knows what it is, but uh, it's observationally there. Um, so I returned to Goddard from uh, Copenhagen um, to work uh, in November 1998 to work on our wire project. But wire had a problem once it reached orbit. Our project was dead. Around that time, John sent an email to me in Stenonomont that he met Rob Cutwit at one of the conferences. They were doing the so-called Tumas survey, and that deep parts of that survey appear to be useful for our CIB fluctuation analysis. So we made an arrangement with Rock. We dove into Tumas. We developed more tools for what is now known as source subtracted cosmic infrared background. And we had cosmological detection at 1.2, 1.6, and 2.2 micron, the first of its sorts uh, that we published in two papers. Around that time, it occurred to me that we can probe the signal from first sources, the so-called population three that I was um, uh, suggested to work on uh, during my PhD. And we can do it with source subtracted cosmic infrared background fluctuations if we remove enough of them at certain wavelengths with some instruments, we could perhaps see the path from the very early time. So we were joined by Ray Current and Harvey Mosley and went looking for necessary data. Harvey at that time uh, realized that uh, uh, a deep calibration field that he had access to from Spitzer IRAC instrument exists and would be highly useful in the range that we get the data from Giovanni Fazio. Uh, we began that work. And we also got a five year NSF uh, uh, research award to, to do uh, this and related work. 
I want to dwell on one transparency about uh, another aspect that proved important to me. When I moved back to Goddard, I moved back into this unique structure that I have never seen anywhere else of synthesis between government and corporate structure. I started at Hughes STX, then we were sold like football players to Raytheon STX, then it became Raytheon ITSS, and from, I think, 2001 or so, I was at SSAI always uh, 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 through this, these years and the management of Bob Cornett. It is a unique, in my experience, setup which taught me how to stay within budgets, uh, do budgets, get external funding, and so on. I utilized it to do some of my best and most basic science. And it also allowed me, on occasion, to branch out into uh, other things such as ozone and climate studies that I worked briefly on. Um, so since uh, 21st, uh, since 2001, I have been with SSAI, run by Om Baheti, and uh, found the atmosphere there, while corporate, very much conducive to scientific exploration and always helpful in preparing grant applications, processing with visitors and such things. So as a result, I will be there beyond 2030, I, as I will talk <laughs> in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, how many minutes do I have? Keep going, keep going. Okay. So uh, going back to that Spitzer data set that Harvey Mosley arranged for us to get, uh, it appeared that we were getting somewhere with that, uh, and uh, maybe somewhere with that idea. Uh, so uh, it was processed remarkably well uh, by recurrent, and it appeared that there was a faint residual signal in the cosmic infrared background fluctuations left in the maps, which was clearly in excess of that from remaining known galaxies. So I thought that that was a remnant from first star's era, from the very early stars, we just removed enough, and we could see you know, a signal that talks like POP3, walks like POP3, clusters like POP3. So uh, we submitted a paper to Nature, which was processed as an article, which is a top tier of Nature, remarkably painlessly, except that Nature made us rewrite it in a completely different style a much more strident style, nature style. It was written like at first when we submitted like a more technical paper. And here it was. And in 2005, in November, once the paper appeared, we had a press release from uh, Nature, NASA, and NSF. We had news and views uh, in Nature by Richard Ellis about this. And a couple of years later, Rick Arendt identified Deep, still deeper data and better data, uh, also with Spitzer, and we continued this work to check if the signal is there, and indeed it was there, so we had this signal, we had, um, that's what it looks like, we had um, another news and views in nature. And if you, I cannot do it, if you take this cursor and move it to here, it's just a nice picture that once you remove all the sources you find the structure, the background with, uh, with the structure that I was talking about. But here is another picture here. So um, we marched on with Cosmic Infrared Background and Spitzer uh, around 2008. Spitzer was uh, finished with its cryogenic stage, moved into its warm stage. And only two IRAC channels at 3.6 and 4.5 micron remained operational. We joined forces with Giovanni Fazio, who planned to do observations of larger fields at these uh, wavelengths, larger yet still deep fields. And um, we obtained the same signal. Here it is. And at that time, Kari Helgeson, a PhD student at UMD at the time, developed a very fine understanding of what remaining galaxies do. And you can see this is what remaining galaxies do. We have a signal that is distributed differently, exceeds that of remaining galaxies by 
a huge margin is highly statistically significant, and this is the same signal at these two wavelengths. In 2007, Gunther Hassinger proposed to correlate this with a cosmic X-ray background to see whether it's the same signal or part of that signal you also see in X-rays. And his then student, Nico Capilouti, worked with us from 2007 until 2013. He still is working with us, but until we got the results there, it was almost six years of work, very hard work. And there was indeed a significant cross power. In other words, this cosmic infrared background is coherent with a cosmic X-ray background, unresolved cosmic X-ray background. So the sources that emit it also emit X-rays. The only sources that can do that are black holes. And when you crunch the numbers, you find that from the level of coherence, at least 5% of our CIB sources must be black holes. For comparison, in today's galaxies, about one in a thousand of sources are black holes. At the peak of star formation, one in a hundred. Here we're talking about huge, huge abundance. What is it? If it comes from the early apex, it, those apex must have been populated by, the black, by black holes. Possible clarity, we'll see how it pans out, came when LIGO discovered gravitational wave from very strange setup of two 30 solar mass black holes that uh, these are strange masses and very similar uh, to, to come from natural stellar evolution. And they're also very similar masses. Um, so if these black holes are primordial and make up dark matter, this signal can just arise naturally. We'll see how it pans out. Uh, and I'm coming to the final uh, stage of my talk. Libra, looking at infrared background radiation and isotropies with Euclid. Euclid is here. It's a dark energy mission, a flagship en dark energy mission uh, that will be launched by um, European Space Agency somewhere around the end of 2020 with a major uh, NASA involvement. And in spring 2012, NASA announced proposal solicitation for Euclid, which is again a major dark energy mission. And the US slots were kept at 40 slots in total because Europeans didn't want to lose control of their mission. So we put together a team of 12, of 12 people proposing a major cosmic infrared background CIB study with Euclid, and we won. We were given seven slots. Uh, we are the second largest U.S. team there after the dark energy team on the Jason Rhodes. And uh, um, here our team includes Rick Arendt and Harvey Mosley, and we have colleagues in Hawaii, Austin, Texas, and Harvard, but headquarters did not improve, approve all 12 of us. And the panel clearly recognized our CIB science, calling it a key question uh, of cosmology. The project will run through 2030 and possibly beyond. We are joined also by um, uh, a dozen of European colleagues, and we spend now 12 hours in time zones, which makes it hard for telecoms. Either someone has to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning or someone has to go uh, to bed after midnight. But it works. SSEI and Goddard were very, very helpful in enabling this project. Uh, many thanks. But just imagine the scope of this. In the 10 plus years of Spitzer-based work, we analyzed the total of less than one half of square degree of the sky at two near IR bands. That was 10 years of work more. Here, we will be working with 15,000 square degrees in three near IR bands and one visible channel. That's the magnitude of the advancement. It's a completely, and it will also be deeper than what we had uh, been working with here. So we'll be going from half a square degree to which we devoted over 10 years to 15,000 square degrees. Remarkable. Uh, Achievement. 
So let me now come, that's the penultimate uh, slide. Uh, I didn't end up going to space, as you can see. But I witnessed another remarkable thing. I got to study space, and I witnessed the creation of cosmology as a precise, exact science, fully comparable to quantum mechanics the way it was in mid-20th century. That's a remarkable achievement. When I was studying, cosmology was just, you could think about anything you want. There was no data. There was no accurate data. There was, you could, you would just speculate. And I personally, until Kobe, never believed that any of these speculations would ever uh, uh, be constrained. But today we understand the entire pillar of cosmology. It's remarkable. And we understand it with very high accuracy. On top of it is a paradigm that in the beginning there was inflationary error that creates so-called anti-gravity, negative pressure, and so on. Uh, that's a paradigm. It has some weird things like it requires some scalar field with some particular properties. But this paradigm leads to very concrete predictions, all of which have been verified. What this inflationary paradigm is in detail, no one knows yet. But the rest, once you start with this paradigm, is established highly well. You form first heavy elements, deuterium and helium. Deuterium is very important because you can form it only in the Big Bang. You need free neutrons, which don't exist today. So for the first 10 minutes, you had free neutrons. You could form deuterium. After the Big Bang, deuterium is only burned. Um, then the CMB, cosmic microwave background spectrum, is fixed to be that remarkable black body that we see today with fires. Then there was a period when radiation and matter uh, 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 energy densities equalize. In the very early stages, you are dominated by radiation, cosmic microwave background. And then later, you're dominated by uh, uh, matter. But in that period, is imprinted a very fine scale called, called baryonic acoustic oscillations. It's just that there should be a slight shift in the clustering properties of matter, somewhere around 150 megaparsecs. Very slight, it has been measured at high precision in the last five years or so. Um, remarkable, at nearby epochs, but it has been measured. It is there. So this epoch is established also. And then CMB finally cools enough, it recombines, and we have mapped its structure of this so-called last scattering, last scattering surface when the universe was 400,000 years old, more or less, we have mapped it with fine precision. All of these are in agreement with this paradigm. If we move in that pillar or cone from the other direction, we map galaxies today out to, roughly speaking, when the universe was 1 billion years old. But there is this gap here, so-called dark ages, the universe comes out of here with neutral hydrogen, it recombines, but then it starts slowly forming first sources. What they were, no one knows. And this is where we will hopefully come in and hopefully we'll have something to say about this era, the last brick that uh, should be put in this cone. We'll see how it goes. So Libra science goals are listed here, we'll measure all sky cosmic infrared background fluctuations with sub percent accuracy, statistical accuracy. We will measure how coherent they are highly accurately with cosmic X ray background. There will be another satellite called Erosita that will be going up. We'll measure all sorts of other auxiliary things. We'll measure the epochs of these populations because if they are at high uh, redshifts, early epochs, you should not see them below the alignment alpha line of emission, so there would be no signal at the visible channel of Euclid. Um, 
or should be no uh, signal if they come from early times. And we'll determine a lot of other things. We should uh, know more, uh, oh, probably sometime in 2021, it goes up in 2020, so stay tuned. But we'll be working on it through 2030. So let me sum up my key define, defining moments um, of the journey. I, as I said, I didn't get to space yet. I still hope to. But here they are, getting the name of my grandfather, Alexander Buxtin. Um, hearing of Apollo 18 on that Sunday morning of December 22, 1968, completely swept me off my feet. Um, was by pure chance. I just, my parents were asleep, I turned on the radio and that's what it had. Then reading that book by Stanislav Lem around that time, the Mangelani cloud, cloud it drove me completely nuts. Uh, I would not be here if it wasn't for that book. And then uh, Riga School number one, which I enjoyed tremendously. Uh, PhD research at Cambridge, which I enjoyed tremendously. The collapse of the Soviet uh, political system and ideology, which uh, was coming, and I'm proud to see, uh, to witness its collapse. Uh, witnessing the Kobe revolution up close at Goddard, until I saw it, I never thought that these things could be measurable and constraining. I was privileged again by pure chance to be at that 1998 conference in California where dark energy was announced, uh, which also transformed me. And then in 2013, the selection of Libra, uh, our project uh, that will run through 2030, uh, that has a lot of, we have a lot of work to do there. We'll see how it goes, but we have a great team. And of course, the best uh, is yet to come, but we don't know it. I continue to be greatly puzzled by the anthropic principle. I remember coming across that paper in Ma on Martin Rees's desk. It's a remarkable coincidence. Uh, don't know. Greatly puzzling. So that's my journey so far. Thank you.